Right, the last speaker for the motion, Douglas Murray, author and journalist and Associate Director of the Henry Jackson Society. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you uh, to our hosts here tonight. Um, if I can open on a uh, spirit of boring bipartisanship, I want to agree with a lot of what our opponents here tonight have said, um, particularly what Roger Cohen just said now. Um, I certainly speak for myself, and I think speaking for our side in this debate tonight, certainly feel nothing like contempt for the people who have risen up against their governments in this historic last few months. Far from it. Uh, far from it. Uh, we certainly don't say that they cannot aspire uh, to a better life. We hope they can. We encourage them to. So that, those straw men, if I may say so, don't please fall for it. But secondly, I wanted to say that I also agree with Ahmed when he said what the problems are in the societies that we're talking about, not just Egypt, but in each of the societies which we'll talk about tonight. They have, I reckon myself, two primary problems. One, uh, the terrific lack of democratic accountability across the region. And two, the terrible uh, possession uh, by a tiny elite of the vast proportion of the wealth of those nations, the, as Ahmed said, the utterly inequitable distribution of wealth. Uh, any of these countries, as you well know, when you go around any of the countries in the region, you see this with your own eyes. Anyone can see it. A tourist can see it. Uh, somebody with no knowledge of the region can see it. The fact that youth, the best hopes of a prosperous future for a country, stand around on street corners with nothing to do, with no jobs, with no future, um, hawking around for tiny amounts of money when they could be the future of their country and they should be the future of their country. So let's not start with the idea that this is about us saying those people shouldn't have the life we believe they should. But it is very complex and very difficult and very worrying. Uh, what is happening and what will happen in the future. So we're not arguing a case of pessimism, but one for caution. You know, uh, Milan uh, Kundera said in Testaments Betrayed that a man stumbles along a path in his life, and woman, may, may I add, just in case anyone wants to try to pick me up on that one, uh, that we walk uh, along a path in life where we're surrounded by fog, and we stumble along and we find a way. Uh, this isn't the interesting observation. The interesting observation is this, I think. Kundera says that when man looks back, he sees the man, he sees the path, but he doesn't see the fog. Everything afterwards looks like it was meant to happen. Uh, everything looks like it was inevitable. The Whig interpretations take over. Um, but as we're stumbling along this path, as North Africa and the Middle East stumbles along this path at the moment, it is very hard uh, to see and to predict with any certainty uh, the course of events. But I wanted to make, for our side, a couple of points which I think, as I say, should urge you to some degree of caution. The first, I would argue, is this. There are some patterns emerging. This is very early, but some patterns emerging. One of the most troubling to me is the following, that in the region, if you survey the governments, those who have fallen, those who are at threat, those who seem to be under no threat at all, by and large, it is now possible to say that the slightly better or less worst governments have been most vulnerable to these revolutions and the most bloodied, the most bloodthirsty, the most intransigent seem to be under no risk at all. What I mean by that is that the government of Tunisia, one of the less bad governments in the region, certainly I'm not going to argue it's good, don't, uh, don't mistake me for a moment, but by and large those governments who are not willing uh, and have not been willing to send uh, their troops out and gun down as many people as possible have gone. And those who are willing to be the most bloodthirsty are staying. Saudi was meant to have a day of rage. But, of course, all the people who were going to partake in it disappeared into prisons, arrested, and so on. 
So it didn't happen. In Iran, we know the regime there, which has the blood of so many students and others on their hands, is willing again and again to gun down those people. So it is likely it will stay at the moment. I think this is, I flag up first, a very bad, very negative lesson of these last few months, and one we must hope doesn't continue. But it is a pattern that is emerging and should trouble us. The second issue is, those of us who feel only admiration for this historic set of events, only admiration for the people who have made history by, for the first time in the region, changing governments, not by military coup, but by a bottom-up revolution against those governments, there is reason to be, have great concern for their hopes and their future. What happens to revolutionaries after the revolution? We all know from history that the revolutionaries tend not to survive the revolution and the bodies of liberals lay over the barbed wire as others walk over them to the future they would like. And there are some signs that that will happen in the region. Now, certainly, if I were a young Egyptian in Tahrir Square, I would feel that my hopes for my country's future had by no means been answered so far when we still have the military in control of the country, when we still see that. So yes, one would like to be optimistic. I would love to be as optimistic as anyone about this. But I think we have to have an element of caution. Thirdly, you can generally judge societies and the patterns that are going to emerge from them by the way in which they treat minorities, by the way that those who are not the leading class, racial, religious group, whatever, in the country are treated, and there are already, again, very troubling signs of this. In Tunisia, in February, only days after the overthrow of the government, uh, Islamists uh, tore into the old quarter in Tunis and shut down those shops that they believed uh, were haram. There was, of course, the murder of a Polish Catholic priest. I think I can be safe in saying the first sectarian murder of that kind in modern Tunisian history. And for the first time in modern history in Tunisia, a country with no history of uh, anti-Semitism in recent decades, anti-Semitic slogans started to be chanted for the first time outside the local synagogue. We know, we all know, we've all seen what's been happening in recent weeks with the treatment of Copts in Egypt. And it would be a very unwise thing to watch the emerging pact between Salafi elements and the Brotherhood in Egypt with anything other than a feeling of concern and caution. That's a little of what I think is happening in the region, but I wanted to highlight one other thing, which is what is happening in the West about this. Because I believe that Western democracies, free societies of any kind, have a duty to help those people who also seek freedom, who seek democracy, who seek to overthrow governments which would behave in the way that governments across the Middle East have behaved for decades. But there is terrible concern about this even. Gaddafi, it couldn't, be hard, it couldn't be easier to find an outspoken, intransigent enemy of the West, and now somebody who has been massacring, yet again, his own people. And the best that the democracies can do is to have a no-fly zone and say that the only thing worth doing, i.e. the toppling of Gaddafi, the killing even of Gaddafi is the one thing they won't do. We then see in recent days, one minute, in recent days, Hillary Clinton saying that Assad is still able to be a reformer. As his troops gun down the Syrian people, she says it's possible he could still be the key. We see David Cameron walking around Tahrir Square and then going straight to Saudi and speaking to the Saudi Minister of Defense who's just been pimping his troops out to the Bahrain government to shoot the people of Bahrain. You know, there is no, there is no will in, in the free democracies to help. And this is why I think that the case that our side, and certainly I am arguing tonight, is not that we should be pessimistic, but that we should be very cautious, wish our friends very, very much hope and wish them well, but to warn them of what could happen and to pray they don't go down those paths. Thank you. Who's got the microphone here? And move that microphone somewhere else, please. Um, yes, yeah, so I've got a question for the proposition for the motion. Um, you mentioned examples of Turkey 
when you were talking about revolutions. You also mentioned 1848, the American Revolution, the French Revolution. I was wondering why you didn't discuss the most recent, recent revolution and transition to democracy in a Muslim country, which would be in Indonesia in 1998, where we have seen in the past 12 to 13 years a strong democratic institution being built and strong performance in the economy in the post-Saharto era. Also a situation very similar to Egypt with large degrees of official corruption and misuse of resources. Okay. I, I just wanted to clear up, if I may, if I was, uh, seemed to imply, well, no, he did imply, he said, that uh, our side weren't aware that Iranians aren't Arabs. I just wanted to clear out that straw man, which is that we are aware of that. But, um, but and I just wanted to end on that and on the issue here. Um, I, would just, I would just make the following point, is that uh, no two revolutions are ever the same, and they're very rarely even that alike. Uh, as they say, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And there are echoes one can hear. I don't think Indonesia, the example of Indonesia and the problems that Indonesian society has got over in the last decade or more are the same as those that the, the, that the Middle East is facing, the same economic reasons, and particularly this issue not just of political corruption, but of political parties that have lain dormant in some cases or been uh, n more than uh, dormant and uh, have a chance now to make their voice heard in a way which I think is more troubling than the situation was there. Now, quickly, among all six of you, is there one model, or are we seeing very specific, very different models right across North Africa and the Middle East? Any of you, quickly? I just say the reactions are very different, and the outcomes are possibly going to be uh, very different as well. I mean, there's a tendency when you look back on any revolution uh, to try to make some coherence out of it, and people even do it when they talk about uh, post-1989. I mean, people still talk about as if every uh, country in the former Eastern Bloc uh, is now exactly the same in its uh, democratic system. And as anyone who knows Eastern Europe uh, here can, can tell you, uh, the, re the differences that are visible now and palpable now from country to country there is still wildly different. Um, now the first winding up uh, set of remarks from Douglas Murray. Well, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to first of all pick up and uh, with the, la the uh, lady at the front here who mentioned the significance of women in this. It, I think it, it, it should have been said earlier. There is, a, there is something in common worldwide of societies that become stable, decent, thriving countries, and that is the liberation of women. That's the thing they always have in common, and that's what we must hope happens here. Somebody said peace, uh, asked a question about peace in the Middle East and where hasn't been answered. I just very quickly wanted to say that um, one of the important things one must hope for in the coming years, whatever happens, is the retention by whatever regime comes in in uh, Egypt to retain, among other things, the peace treaty with Israel, which is, I think, key in the region, the worst imaginable time for there to be a conflagration again. Uh, thirdly, uh, somebody mentioned, uh, I, I, I mentioned at the outset, the, the problem of wanting to know whether or not there was a commitment in other democracies to assist, and I think one of the most practical things is not actually money. We don't need to pour in money at this point. But, uh, but pouring in people who know how to do things like running departments, like very basic stuff like uh, you know, account keeping within government departments, uh, oversight, all sorts of other things that don't require money but just require our commitment. Um, somebody said uh, the motion was wretched, and I have to say I couldn't agree more. Um, I'm very sorry. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a, um, a diplomat any more than I am a prophet, and this motion asks you and indeed us to be prophets. Uh, uh, I would just say this, um, I hope that we can come back and have this debate next year, in five years' time, in ten years' time, those of us around in some decades to come. I hope it's an annual fixture. And what's more, I hope that I and this side are proved wrong. I very much hope it, uh, but I would urge once again that uh, whatever our hopes, we also approach what is happening at the moment with caution and with care, and not to be blinded by our optimism.